very much. In my professional life, I've been dealing with monetary policy, fiscal policy, but the most attention I have is dedicated to institutional policies, or institutions and their changes. And what I'm going to say very briefly belongs to this stream. Is it working? No, it's not working. <laughs> so where should I aim this instrument? <laughs> Ah, so this is, so when should I aim? At this direction? Okay, we'll see, by trial and error. So these are very ambitious uh, uh, po points. Let me start. Okay, I know now. Okay, as we know, there is a lot of confusion about the basic concepts, which are very important. Like rule of law, freedom, democracy, etc., etc. And one should deal with this confusion because otherwise it is very harmful. <clears throat> so I start with a very few remarks uh, on that. There are two main sources of this confusion of manipulating concepts. First, there is a status propaganda. You might remember that according to Putin, there is a democracy in Russia. And then bad social science which manipulates the concept, especially some philosophers who take that concept or the term freedom and give completely different meanings. And they are famous, like Hegel. I try to understand what Heidegger was writing about, that's impossible. <laughs> but he is worshipped. Okay. So, and we have also a popular propaganda in, the, in most countries, including the West, which raises expectations about what the state can and should do. Some would pointedly I'll call it the mentality of the Soviet official, which means whatever is the problem, only the state can solve this problem. We you know that the state creates more problems than it solves. But, you know, Policies depend on politics. When politics is bad, policies are bad. So one has to tackle politics either from inside or from outside. Because I don't think there are many intellectual puzzles about stability, economic growth. But despite that, we get a lot of bad policies. Why? Because status views prevail. Uh, this is not a battle of ideas, because states do not have ideas, they have slogans. So you have to battle them, to unmask them. It's a question of mass communication. This is why I spend most of my time on Twitter in Poland. And they've got more than 300,000 followers on Facebook and in the TV, because otherwise the audience will be captured by the status. <coughs> not this way. Okay, and also in the social sciences, I've been going to mention we have a social bias, uh, the state's bias, including mainstream economics, I come to that, and some legal sciences. And the main message of such thinkers as uh, Buchanan, Talok, which is in fact a common science, that politicians are no better or worse on average than other people. But the status message is based on a hidden assumption, they are better. <laughs> and of course, this is uh, not true. So what uh, one of the wisest men in office has said, James Madison, you see this quotation, I think uh, it's still valid. So that if men were no angels, no government <laughs> would be necessary if angels were government, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. I think this is the essence. Now, coming to freedom in general, let me only notice the misuse of this term if it is equated with wealth, power, etc. So it's another manipulation, and Hayek was one of the persons who has protested against this manipulation. Freedom has many meanings, but I think the most important one, the most important, is the relationship between individuals and the state. 
which depends on the nature of the state. And I don't think one can sensibly discuss this very important dimension of freedom without discussing differences in institutional regimes. And one concept I found useful is to define crimes as any actions which are punished by the state. And a very useful distinction is between ordinary crimes and what is called political crimes. So political against the regime. And you find that most crimes of political nature were present under socialists or communists, which brings me to a very brief typology of institutional regimes. I think there are four or five dimensions which now can be measured. And these dimensions are democracy, civil rights, rule of law, economic freedom, and fiscal stance. If you exclude taxes from the measurement of economic freedom, and very briefly, I think it is the best to define democracy as open and legal competition resulting in regular elections, more or less like Schumpeter has done. And then you see that if civil rights are suppressed, there is no possibility for competition and there is no democracy. If the rule of law is abolished, there is no democracy because you can arrest your opponent like Putin has done with Navalny. <laughs> And that's funny when I hear in the Western media that Putin has won elections. What elections? <laughs> you know, this is manipulation of, of the language. Uh, and finally, on the fiscal stand, I will mention something because there's a lot of uh, misinformation about it. Why, if you introduce socialism or communism, meaning monopoly of state ownership, and central planning, which replaces the market. So this is the regime which completely suppresses economic freedom. Then you have to suppress other freedoms too. In this sense, it is the most despotic, and it's a logic of this system. Why? For two reasons. Each of them is sufficient. First, if you introduce monopoly of state ownership, you can dismiss everybody and reward everybody. But secondly, we know that socialist regime can function only badly, economically, relative to capitalistic regimes. So can you have, can you have regular honest elections if the system functions very badly? Only when most people are socialists in their mentality, and this is not very likely. <laughs> so as a result, socialists can be maintained only based on force. And it can last, unfortunately, for the long time. And the most important socialist institution is KGB, or something of this sort, like in East Germany, <laughs> very famous institution. This is the essence. While regimes or systems which are based on freedom produce better results, but this is not sufficient for them to be preserved. Why? I am coming to that because they tend to be undermined from within by various status interest groups. The conclusion is you have to fight for good things. Good things in themselves are not sufficient to defend themselves. And this is why such societies <laughs> and their activities are so very, very important. Now, very briefly, many people are surprised why most Arab countries are performing very badly economically. They should not be, because they are quasi-socialistic. Dominance of state ownership, including Iran. Only first secretary is called Ayatollah. Including South Arabia, you have a socialist king. <laughs> Iraq, etc., etc. So it is not, I think, Islam in itself, but socialism, or quasi-socialism. Now, the only viable system is the one based on private ownership, but we have many different types of capitalism. And the one, which I call free market capitalism, based on the rule of law, otherwise you can't have free markets, is the most attacked. I am coming to that. So it's based on economic freedom, and economic freedom in the West, in free societies, and very, very much attacked. This is why I'm calling this the paradox 
of economic freedom. Much worse type of capitalism is chronic capitalism, like in Russia, where you have a sharp division of businessmen into politically linked, called oligarchs, and the rest, which is discriminated. And many Western economists belong to the category which I would call overregulated and fiscally fragile, like Italy. And it is not because of European Union that Italy is in problems, it's because of Italian politics, which leads to bad policies, delays in reforms, etc., etc. Okay, so the main point I want to make is that economic freedom should be discussed in connection with different institutional regime. And one more remark, you've heard about the Wagner law. This is not a law. This is a very weak empirical observation because Wagner law says that the richer the country is, the more budgetary spending it has. And you have here a diagram which on the horizontal axis displays per capita income. On the, uh, uh, the another axis you've got what percentage of GDP constitute social spending. And you see this enormous variation at every level of per capita. This is taken from my recent publication in Cato <laughs> Journal. At every level, and poor countries which start with high social spending are going to remain poor. While they are praised <laughs> by some people. Another perhaps surprising fact is that the United States has higher social spending than Canada or Switzerland. But while statists present United States as a jungle. United States is no more a free market country. Not only because of that, also because of lots of regulations, especially in the state level. So we rather looked, paradoxically perhaps, to Sweden, disregarding relatively high social spending, but the old Swedish model is not anymore operating in Sweden, but in France, in terms of the ratio of social spending to GDP. This is record. Okay. So I mentioned this, I will skip. I only stress once again that if you take away economic freedom, you have to take all the freedoms. And you can rule by force, not only by misusing the justice system, but using, but using the central planning, by rewarding or punishing people. And the central plant economy, you could not buy a car. You have to have allocation. So Trabant, I understand, were allocated, not only small fiats in Poland. And who operates allocation system? The politicians. So you don't even need, you need in extreme cases, the criminal law, which is unjust because it's directed against political opponents. It was the most repressive system. <clears throat> now, so let me repeat once again, the socialist, uh, socialist, democratic socialist is a complete utopia. It's a mental aberration. It's a theoretical construct. It is rather a slogan. Now, of course, these who say democratic socialists, they say Sweden has democratic socialists. <laughs> But this is a manipulation of the concept because originally socialism was rightly defined as a monopoly of state ownership, anti-capitalism. And when they say Sweden is socialistic, they have in mind large welfare state. But on that definition, every Western economy is socialist, including United States. So where would we look to capitalism in the sense of small welfare state in Africa? So it's one of the examples of the results of absurd concepts. So concepts matter extremely, very much. So I can tell you that a good part of my activity now, it's unmasking and ridiculing status concepts using satire, if possible. Okay. Uh, very briefly, on economic uh, 
freedom. I think has, it has two dimensions. Uh, okay, where I am. All right, it is the freedom of consumption and the freedom in the sphere of production. We are mostly focusing on the freedom of production, but let me mention that freedom of consumption has been historically restricted by various restrictions. For example, how can you dress? Peasants were prohibited for dressing like the nobles. And nowadays, in the countries of Orthodox Islam, you have a reduced freedom of consumption regarding women. <clears throat> But let me turn to this. I think this most productive dimension of economic freedom includes free labor and property rights. Now, it is often overlooked that free labor is relatively recent historical invention. Slavery, servitude, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, but also, I found it recently, surprisingly, that in Anglo-Saxon countries in the 19th century, there was a very much restricted freedom of nominally free laborers. This was removed thanks to classical liberalism and replaced by social policies which favor uh, uh, empl employees to the detriment of employment. You know, labor market regulation is very pernicious. It's excessive protection of the rights of employees, and it results, as we know, in a pervasive systematic unemployment. But we have a shift. Now, uh, but what is the most important is property rights, and the most vicious debates were regarding uh, property rights. And if you read 19th century socialist literature, it was absolutely demonized by Marx, early socialist, and it acted in a sense that it has poisoned the minds of many people. Marx called himself a scientific socialist, but there was nothing scientific in it. It was based on fallacies from the very beginning, logical fallacies in the definition of exploitation. So when I was a student, somehow I was wrong when I was reading this, <laughs> I thought it was an artificial construction. But why it has been so popular? We come to politics. In mass politics, you don't need to be intellectually right, correct. It's better to be correct, but this is not necessary. You have to master emotions. And these, either by religion, or quasi-religion. Marxism was a quasi-religion. What does it mean? In a quasi-religion, you have to point out who are the enemies. These were bourgeois capitalists. <laughs> and you have to paint the vision of the paradise. It was called communism. And paradoxically, it was full of freedom and abundance. It was a complete mental aberration from the very beginning. And there are some people who were pointed out, but it prevailed over the masses. Why? Because frustrated intellectuals are very dangerous. Very dangerous if they are good manipulators. Because look, at the top are usually frustrated intellectuals. And the worst when they come to power, like Lenin and his followers, we are also frustrated individuals who turn out to be ruthless and capable state terrorists. And then we have beginning of 80, 70, 50 years of a system which was very bad on all the dimensions, but was maintained by force and intimidation. So whenever I hear that, for example, Mr. Piketty is called New Marx, I wonder, is it a compliment? And it turns out it is a compliment in the West. It's something wrong. A lot of things to do. By the way, this book is based on fallacies, including that his main recommendation do not follow of his, of his analysis. 
completely separated, but he was admitted by President Obama. <laughs> and when I remember I, was, uh, I gave a speech at London School of Economics, I was in the third, the first was Piketty. And I have seen these students who are worshiping him without understanding what he was saying, but impressed by his graphs. This is the power of hateful status propaganda. Now, let me turn to the paradox of economic freedom. We know, beyond reasonable doubt, that extensive economic freedom within the rule of law is indispensable for the long-term rapid economic growth, including the catching up of the poor countries. In the sense that the more drastic is suppression of economic freedom, the worse are results compared to fully-fledged economic freedom within the rule of law. This is empirical. It's not doctrinaire. And I am speaking about the long run, not the short run, not the fiscal stimulation. But we know also that without extensive economic freedom within the rule of law, there, would be no, there could be no democracy. So huge suppression eliminates democracy. And there are some people who hate capitalism and like democracy. Mental aberration. So I'm saying they should love capitalists with a substitute love, as an indispensable condition for democracy. So it's absolutely important. And at the same time, it's the most attacked, including in the West. And this is something one should think why and what to do. I've been thinking about it. And I would share with you some observations. But first, let me say this is about Marxism. The most vicious attack on economic freedom, and as a result on all the freedoms, including rule of law, under the guise of freedom. In 19th century, there were many intellectuals who were saying that private ownership is against freedom. And uh, manipulation, of it, it was very effective. Now, this is also what I mentioned, that quasi-religious doctrines can be effective if they activate strong emotions. And strong emotions are usually negative, hatred and the vision of the paradise. In this sense, Islamic fundamentalism has the same mechanism on a different paradise, <laughs> different enemies. But psychologically speaking, it's the same as Marxism, then Leninism, Maoism, etc., etc. Now, but let me turn to the West. And we know that economic freedom has been under attack in the West too, not so drastically. Even though one should remember that the last major nationalization took place in France under Mitterrand at the beginning of the 80s. So far, it was the last major nationalization in the West, but it shows the power of status doctrines. What we've been watching, and I would like to discuss this at two levels. What, first, what policies have been pursued in various countries uh, heading in the status direction, and then more speculatively, why? So first is po policies level, the second is politics. And I think we are witnessing four kinds of interventionism, meaning as a deviation in the status direction from <clears throat> fully-fledged economic freedom within the framework of the liberal law, which presumes, as Hayek rightly stressed, general rules and not specific. And, not, and you know that if you have state ownership, you don't even need regulations because you can issue instructions by telephone. This is the favorite policy instrument under communism. Form. Now, so very briefly, <clears throat> as far as uh, these are four components of, uh, of types of interventionism, which I will discuss very briefly. Regarding state interventionism, 
One should remember that in some Western countries, perhaps not so much in Germany after the Second World War, but in Italy, France, there was a substantial proportion of state ownership, the most of it in Italy because of Mussolini, and these famous conglomerates, Iri, any, it was the legacy of Mussolini, <laughs> and most countries managed to reduce it. Why? It, all the reforms of state ownership has failed. As Mises has said, the only effective reform of socialism is turning it into capitalism. And he said that some 80 years ago. <laughs> he was, why? Because of politicization. It is not that politicians are on average worse than other people, but politicians in the role of investors are facing pathological incentives. They bear no financial responsibility for failures, but they profit for spectacular white elephants projects. So the only solution is to reduce to the minimum the power of politicians regarding detailed projects, which means aiming at a minimum state. You can't reform human nature. You have to take away possibilities to harm from the politician. You can't improve the... <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, trying to reduce the expansion of the state, we are fighting for better decisions in society. But notice that there are various enclaves of socialists in the developed Western economies. And we have a sort of experiments, natural experiments. One of the recent fallacies and previous fallacies too was to blame financial crisis on uh, capitalism, meaning uh, freedom, market, etc. Everybody was repeating, it was very fashionable. Whenever G7, G7 met, they have to blame somebody. They could not blame each other and central bankers, so they have to blame the bankers. I am not saying they're completely innocent, but the behavior of the bankers depends, like everybody else, depends on the incentives. And there are many wrong policies which have contributed to wrong decisions by the financial institutions, <clears throat> too, too big to fail, favoring uh, borrowing relative to equity and eight or nine wrong institutions which were present and not yet removed completely. But also, there was state ownership of financial institutions. And we have a natural experiment in the sense that we can compare, for example, Spanish banks. And there are two kinds, Cajas, which are reg regionally politicized banks, and Santander, etc. Where are the problems? In Cajas, why? Because they were politicized. To some extent, lender banking in Germany, perhaps not so dramatically, but two. Fannie Mae and Fannie Mae, this is a socialist institution <laughs> in the sense of politicization, so a very important part. Slovenia, recently, a catastrophe of state owned banks. So, enclaves of socialists still exist and they contribute to crisis, but crises are blamed by status on, on capitalism. So one has to unmask it and to find out the the reasons. Now, regulatory interventionism is a product of interest groups. So one has to analyze interest groups and the interplay and the balance of interest groups. Uh, a great scientist of this subject was Mark Ma, uh, Olson but there are some interest groups which he has not analyzed, I would say a stronger role of ideologically guided interest groups. State is ideologically guided interest groups. For example, those who want to save the planet and think that people are a detriment to nature. I think there is a sort of a German romanticism in this field. <laughs> and they are very influential, why? Emotions. Whenever I see the movie about the uh, Arctic and see these poor white bears, and then it's always the message, human activity undermines 
that was, and people like white bears from the distance, of course. <laughs> white bears, etc. So one has to look at the interplay of a, a balance, shifting balance of various interest groups because they are producing regulations. And politicians trying to pick up, typical politicians, what would attract more votes and not necessarily what serve more the economy. And it would never end because interest groups operate because of civil rights. So this is general freedom and we cannot ban status interest groups. <laughs> we have to be better with this unmasking their message and with spreading the message of freedom and the rule of law, which is, I know, not a very easy task, but without that, it would be even worse. There would be no hope. Now, uh, one interesting idea by uh, Epstein, who was a guest here some years ago, was to look at regulations which de facto expropriate the people, that annihilate property rights, and to demand indemnation. Not only outright nationalization, but hidden nationalization back. Let me move to welfare state international. Now, the 100% of the unprecedented increase in budgetary spending during the last 100 years in all countries is due to the welfare state tightness. So there was a powerful pressure, regardless very much of results. And this is one of the expansions that is the most difficult to resist ahead of fiscal crisis. Fiscal crisis are ultimate uh, barrier to expansion. <clears throat> what matters is not only the size, which most countries are successive, but the structure. And I Italy, for example, you have lower social spending than, say, in uh, France, but lots of social traps, which means that the construction of taxes on the one hand and social spending is such that it discourages people from working. In Poland, we have this, and this is, of course, a very bad combination. Very difficult fight against it. One would have to unmask these various slogans that with, uh, and fallacies that without extensive welfare state, people would be dying on the street. And pa painting United States as inhuman country, I'm not speaking now about current president, <laughs> but the normal picture. <coughs> And finally, macroeconomic interventionism. This is first fiscal policy. I thought that Keynesianism was intellectually dead in the 70s because of stagnation, but it was dead intellectually, but influential politically. As a miraculous cure against recession after the crisis. So which means that intellectual rigor does not matter very much in the political debate. One has to fight fallacies. And what was the new dirty word on fiscal? Austerity. By definition, it was bad. And this was clear in such juxtaposition like austerity or growth, <laughs> implying that austerity is bad for growth. And most of the media were against austerity, which in fact means fiscal discipline. A new dimension of macroeconomic intervention is this unconventional monetary policy, which I skipped to the discussion. I was rather critical from the very beginning. I thought that perhaps one year or two, some of the instrument could be justified given the legacy of big institutions, but not later. And the big question is what happens? What about the exit? And what about if a new recession comes? Finally, This was about policies and mixed with uh, propaganda, but let me mention some of propaganda. There's a lot which we have to fight. A mentality of Soviet officials, implicit or explicit assumption to whatever problem there is, it is only the state which can solve it. It should be named, ridiculed, and unmasked. Then, a stupid but popular uh, 
assumption that complex economic system require more intervention. This was unmasked by Hayek with his spontaneous system, but still, it's pretty popular. You can ask, what about nature? Where is the central planet in nature? They would say God. <laughs> uh, where we have a, a huge disregard of uh, empirical and historical rest lesson. Finally, emotionally loaded words are very dangerous, negative, and one should never accept these words. One should unmask them. Or uh, statements like greed is a result of capitalism, etc., <laughs> etc. Et Equally dangerous or even more are nice words, which mask bad policies. And one of the uh, most dangerous nice words is social, because it sounds very good. Antisocial is very bad. Why social market policy in Germany? It was a very nice word. And there were hundreds of definitions of what is social. I am not against good social policy, I am against slogans, which are cheating the people. In Poland, unfortunately, some of our politicians imported social market policy and introduced into the Polish constitution. And not, it was not done in Germany. I am very afraid what is going to happen in the legal sense. <laughs> so, battling words, especially emotionally loaded words, is extremely, extremely important. <clears throat> I skip this. <clears throat> I can only say that one, uh, ultimately, one should try to introduce as many barriers to statism. For example, anchoring single market, fiscal responsibility, etc., etc. But ultimately, <clears throat> what decides whether these limits to statism and the rule of law are introduced and then maintained depends on the strength of people and organizations who defend freedom and the rule of law. And this is our unending battle, because I can't, don't foresee that status will disappear from this planet. So it's an optimistic message. We would have a job for a long time. Thank you very much. So I understand, including Akademische Academische Viertelstunde, I have still 15 minutes for the discussion, <laughs> or even a little more. Okay. Yes, please. Ich verstehe Deutsch. Ich bin nicht ganz fließend in Deutsch, auf Deutsch, but ich verstehe. I'll do my best. So, um, as you pointed out, um, many uh, discontent intellectuals uh, perceive uh, socialism as a state of, uh, of paradise. And given uh, the fact that a growing proportion of um, people are dependent on state welfare or are self-perceived uh, net beneficiaries of uh, state welfare, um, uh, do you regret the fact that um, 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 with the end of the Cold War, um, um, ca capitalist um, counter-propaganda has ceased to exist? Um, the, the contest of the systems, East versus West, uh, was in fact um, a contest of, um, of, um, of two economic systems, uh, which both um, were based on a, um, a kind of propaganda. Do you regret the fact that um, capitalism no longer is um, illustrated as um, a kind of uh, paradise, uh, a counter paradise to, to, to socialist um, um, okay, I think I, I think I understand your point, yep. perhaps. Well, first, <clears throat> it was a miracle that this very bad system has collapsed. And nobody could have foreseen, nobody. It was beyond imagination that the former Union would dissolve in such a peaceful way. And this gave freedom to other countries. We started a bit early in Poland, but I am sure that without dissipation of... Uh, Soviet Union, we would have more problems in our reform. So it's beyond doubt. Because this was really empire of evil. 
Regal was right, based on fear, intimidation, and especially lies. Propaganda, which was hurting the dignity of the people. Now, whether it matters for, or for the debates in the West, in the sense that the lack of this bad example makes it more difficult, I don't think, because the supply of socialists in the West is very large. And so it's, it is sufficient to have problems. And what did they do? Statism. Let's say statism. Uh, for more state intervention, people with Soviet mentality, whatever, that's a problem, it is the state which can and should solve it. You, you, can find more, you could find more believing socialists or communists in France. And they were high intellectual in the society. I remember my, my, my son went for a year to France to study and said, Father, they're all communists. <laughs> <laughs> this was at the university. The textbooks were full of anti-capitalistic propaganda in France. So don't worry. There is enough <laughs> status in, in the West. This is mostly or largely based on bad thinking, anti-empirical, anti but also there are wrong incentives. You can be very famous if you are against capitalism or are living under capitalism. And you can gain sometimes a lot of money. Some of the Hollywood movies, movies are against capitalism. Now, who are the devils, corporations? <laughs> Well, etc. Some of the books, and I don't mention the author not to propagate them. This you can be famous. So incentives and people who either do not think or are opportunists supply, because whenever there is a demand, there is a supply. The same as with the drugs. One has to reduce the demand. <laughs> and this is why we have to continue more effectively working on the public opinion to reduce the demand. Under socialism, it was rather risky to be against socialism. <laughs> so it's a complete asymmetry. So be against free market capitalism is cheap, intellectually and morally. And I have no respect whatsoever for these people who are so famous in the status circles in the West. Uh, I would like to ask two questions. So the first one, which marks a slight distend, because you have made remarks uh, with, on banks and bank failures which are which completely in line with um, empirical evidence. Not only those cajas in uh, Spain and uh, banks with public ownership failed, but as well J.P. Morgan and uh, Goldman Sachs failed. And this is due to a mismatch of managerial responsibility and financial liability. So there is a deficit a conceptual deficit in financial capitalism and unless we solve it in a regulated way which increases financial liability for those who are responsible or by financial capitalism, capitalism as such will be um, discredited. Let me just remind you of the fact that the German saving banks owned by municipalities did plain vanilla products and were not involved in the crisis and they continued to supply the economy with good credit and continue to do the work. This is a mark we can open, and this is a, a battle of ideas which has not been heard. The second question concerns your country, which as you know I'm very damned of. We have interesting recent tendencies of repolonization, repolonization of financial institutions, uh, which goes hand in hand with um, an enmityship or enmity against private ownership. Many projects of uh, privatizations in the field of airports or water supply companies have been fought by the current government by saying this must belong to the Polish nation. So what once has been the deification of the state is in Poland today the deification of the, the Polish nation. No, and, the state, and, because... And, and, uh, uh, okay, some, I see your point. I see your and, point. and some, some intellectuals in Poland, like uh, uh, the president of the Society of Political Economy, Mrs. Mauczynska favors this. So how do you think that trend can be reversed and what could be your personal pro uh, contribution to reverse that um, not interesting point? Not interesting now you made two points. One is wrong because you said that, well, look, 
private institutions, financial institutions are also failing. But you have to compare the frequency of failure. Not just the fact that private institutions are failing, because it's obvious, but if you compare the frequency of failures in the state-owned or politically dominated financial institutions versus private, you see large differences. Politically dominated institutions in finance are failing much more frequently, and this is an empirical fact. You could read studies some 10 or 15 years ago of the World Bank when they compare the frequency of banking crisis in over 100 countries of the world, depending on the share of state ownership. And the result was the more in the state hands, the worse. Why? Political meddling in the credit allocation. It's not very good. <laughs> good for some politicians they should run, and very bad for the economy. So compare the frequencies. Never base general statement on examples. <laughs> this is wrong methodologically. On the second point, so let me say that uh, in politics, as in construction industry, accidents happen. And one of the reasons of accidents is when bad guys have good luck. So, uh, to cut it short, this happened in Poland. It did, did not need to happen. But now we are battling a government who is trying to reverse what we have achieved in Poland during the, the previous 27 years, based on uh, statist propaganda and on what the nationalizations, what they call, they are using euphemism. They don't want to call it nationalization, but in fact it's nationalization because they want people to be confused that when they hear Polish, they would not see that it is state-owned. <laughs> and it happened in the banking sector. In Poland, like in other Central European countries, we did not wait for uh, with privatization of the banks because we knew that to preserve state-owned banks would be dangerous. So we privatized them with the participation of foreign capital. It worked quite well, much better than in Russia when they did not have privatization. But recently we have a reversal, and mostly because some uh, institutions, private institutions, want to sell, for example, Unicredit in Poland, and it was bought by state institutions in Poland who have private deposits. So deposit with nationalization with, with uh, private money. And, uh, and this is, as I said, named uh, repolonization, but is in fact nationalization. Based on what I know from empirical studies, it's a very dangerous tendency, which I am <coughs> resisting both individually and uh, with my younger colleagues in the think tank. Ich teste Ihre deutschen Kenntnisse and, and, und mein Englisch. Uh, this is just a comment, one line, maybe praise. Michael Kalecki once said, if you want to have influence, your ideas must be unclear. Mine are clear. I think you disproved that. Well, I am sure I got it, so if somebody could... If you, Michael Kalecki, yes. the uh, Hungarian economist, the Brit Michael Kalecki once said, if you want to have influence, I'm coming from Germany, so I know about my comrades. If you want to have influence, your ideas must be unclear. Mine are clear. I think you disprove that. I don't know what he said. I know that he was a prominent socialist. And his ideas, his ideas were completely clear. Socialist is better than capitalist. Capitalist is bad. He was a brilliant, technically speaking, like Oscar Lange, another socialist. But they started with a criticism of capitalism without comparing it to the alternative system. And when you focus on the criticism without comparison, you are very uh, uh, susceptible to, to errors. So criticism of one solution is not a proof that alternative solution is worse. <laughs>